In this video, we will review select terms from this week's reading. We won't go over every term in the book, but I'd like to call out a couple of specific terms uh, and give some context to them uh, and emphasize their importance moving forward. So let's begin. The first term to discuss is algorithm. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step solution to a problem. You've already seen algorithms in your life. A great example is if you've ever cooked something from a recipe. A recipe lays out a step-by-step -step process by which you combine ingredients and produce something that's hopefully delicious out the other end. Our goal this semester is to work and focus on defining step-by-step -step solutions to problems that we can uh, utilize computational processes uh, to uh, create. Programming. The next thing that we're going to be doing a lot of this semester once we define an algorithm or a way to solve a problem is we're going to write a program. And at the simplest level, a program involves telling a computer what to do. We'll look at different languages and different ways of telling a computer what to do this semester, but essentially that's all programming is. Computers are very literal. Uh, they cannot imply any type of context, so we need to be very specific when we tell them what to do. So the algorithms that we define need to be very specific so that when we tell a computer what to do via a program, it knows what to do. Another term I will discuss a lot is abstraction. Abstraction means to simplify a complex system or idea. We're going to see a lot of abstraction. One of the things we'll see this week is we will be reading input from the user's keyboard at their computer. Well, there's a lot of complexity that happens from when the user types something into the keyboard until it goes down your USB cable into your computer across the motherboard and the CPU and gets processed and into RAM and finally shows up on the screen via the display driver. That's a lot of stuff. But in reality, all we have to do is use something called an intrinsic function called input and we'll get that value to show up without really having to think about anything. Abstraction is this idea that we can have a complex system and have it simplified or you know, we really don't care how it works as long as it works. I've got a lot of those things in my life. I don't really care how Netflix works. I just know that I turn that box on and I can watch TV for hours. Source code. Well, if we're going to be giving instructions to a computer via a program, what we're going to be writing, what our programs are going to consist of is called source code. Source code is going to be human readable instructions for a computer to follow. Now, some students will argue and say, wait, this source code stuff doesn't look human readable. I mean, I'm taking this class. It's not like I can just talk to the computer like it's Siri or Alexa or some other voice assistant. And that's true. We need to learn uh, the way that the computer language is defined and all of the ways that we can combine the different aspects of the computer language. But in essence, it's human readable. We're not writing out zeros and ones uh, or you know, flipping switches. We're actually capable to write something that looks a lot like uh, spoken or written human language. What happens after we write that language is that we're going to have to really understand two steps. First thing is that we are writing human readable language, but computers, well, they don't necessarily work the way humans do. We speak in words, computers like zeros and ones, on and off, high and low voltages. And essentially what has to happen is that source code that we write in our programs is going to have to be converted to machine code. This creates uh, or is computable readable, computer readable instructions. Um, and so whereas it's very easy for humans to read source code, it's almost impossible for humans to read machine code uh, unless your brain is wired that way. And there are some people who can read machine code pretty quickly. Um, on the flip side, computers have to read machine code. They cannot read human re readable code uh, or source code. So how do we get from one to the other? Well, there's going to be this process called compilation. Every time we run a program, what's going to happen is that our high-level human-readable source code is going to get converted to low-level uh, low machine-readable machine code. So compilation is the process of converting what humans can read into code that machines can read and execute. So we're going to be doing this a lot compilation. And we'll talk more about this as we move on in this semester, but this is a process that's actually going to be abstracted from us early on. It's a pretty complex process, but all we're going to do is hit run and our program is going to execute this behind the scenes and just work. But we want to know that this source code to machine code uh, translation process is happening and we want to be aware of it because it's something that we'll need to know more about moving forward. Another term that I'm very specific with in my classes is understanding something called a data type. Now, 
I think most people understand what data is. It's a bit of information. But a data type is really more like a category of information. So just like if you've ever taken biology class, you can categor categorize mammals as, you know, um, homo sapiens as, you know, or you can, as reptiles. I'm not a biologist, so I should probably be, uh, probably had some cheat sheet here to get better examples out of this. But we're used to classifying things. Uh, and it's no different when it comes to data. So a data type really helps us define a piece of information and what can be done to it. It's a category of information. So data type is a fancy way of saying a category of information. So for example, we're gonna be dealing this semester a lot with a type of data called an integer. And an integer is any whole number that is either positive or negative. And so that's what it is. What is an integer? It's any whole number that is either positive or negative. And what can you do to an integer? Well, add, subtract, multiply, divide, print it. There may be some other things, but they're the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. So whenever I use the term data type, what I'm saying is, what is the category of the type of information that we're dealing with? And specifically, I mean, what is the data and what can we do with the data? This is a quick introduction to this topic, and we'll talk more about it as we move forward. Especially in the early part of this class, this is not something that is of big concern to us. Again, it's another item that's somewhat abstracted, but we do want to be aware of the category of data. Other categories of data that we'll see will be floats or doubles, which are numbers with a fractional component. We might see characters, which are single letters, and we'll also see strings, which are words, which are a series of characters, and we'll discuss these more as we move forward. Another item we'll discuss regularly this week is what's called a variable. This is one of the most important concepts to understand and why I'm bringing it up now and why we'll see it again in a future lecture. A variable is a named location in memory for storing a value, which is a really fancy definition. And essentially what variables do is they're like a box and we can put a label on the box. You probably have a box right now uh, where you're living and maybe it says taxes 2016. And in that box is all of the information related to your 2016 taxes. So that's all a variable is. It's a box, and then we can give that box a title, and we can give it any title we want based on some naming rules that we'll learn about later, and we can use that box to hold data. And if you think about a computer, a computer is electricity flowing through it at all times. It's kind of like a river. And if you've ever seen like the Matrix movie with all of the things scrolling down the screen, that's another good way to visualize this. But anytime we want to hold on to a piece of data, we have to put it into a box. If we don't, it'll just float away in that stream of data. So a variable is a way for us to hold on to a bit of very important information, a username, a password, uh, a number like pi, or any value, maybe a, a tax rate, uh, and so on. One of the things that's interesting to note, variables are like magic boxes. They can only hold one piece of data at a time, and anytime we add a new value, it overwrites the old value that's in there. So imagine if you had a box, it had a piece of paper in it, and if you put a new piece of paper in it, you looked in and magically the old one had disappeared. It was destroyed. This is the basic concept of variables. Again, we'll address these in the next video lecture, but this is a general concept that's important to start thinking about right now. Another thing we'll see as we move forward is we're gonna be printing a lot of information so that the human can read it. A lot of what we do, you know, taking input from the keyboard and putting that input as out, <laughs> processing it in some way, and then producing output to the screen for the human to read, uh, is uh, something that's very important, obviously, because we're talking about writing programs to interface with humans. And so one of the things that we're gonna need to do is take lots of different pieces of data and glue them together into readable sentences. And so uh, concatenation is the process of gluing two or more pieces of data together. So just like we can take Legos, which are independent pieces, and assemble them together to make awesome things like the Death Star or a boat uh, or a cool playland, uh, we can take bits of information like words and numbers and values, and we can glue them together to make sentences that make sense. So concatenation is this process by which we can assemble multiple pieces of information to create output that's appropriate to our program. We can take all different types of data and concatenate it together or glue it or assemble it together for user output. Another important term that we'll talk about as we dive into the first programming language we are using this semester is called syntax. Essentially, syntax are the, quote, nuts and bolts, or rules, of a given programming language. So, just like in English, right, uh, we've got very specific rules about how we use verbs and nouns and adjectives and the grammar of our language. Syntax is very much like the grammar uh, rules of our language. 
Intrinsic functions are another important thing that you'll read about this week. And most programming languages uh, come with a large library of pre-written code. Uh, and this pre-written code handles a number of common operations. Like, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. So if someone's already, if there's a very specific process that we need to do over and over again, like read input from the keyboard, then it makes sense for the group that creates our programming language or programming environment to provide us with some pre-written code that does that. We're going to call these intrinsic functions for now. This is uh, functionality that a programming language provides uh, that helps us uh, handle uh, repetitive tasks or tasks that we just shouldn't have to rewrite because they're solved problems. So again, the example would be uh, instead of having to grow our own grain and ground it into flour, we can just go to the store and buy flour. Intrinsic functions are pre-written, pre-bundled bits of code. Now we can combine flour into any number of baked goods, but we don't have to make that fundamental component of so many recipes ourselves. We can just buy that fundamental component. And intrinsic functions are going to be like these fundamental components that are going to help us write code much easier. And finally, one example of an in, uh, intrinsic function is going to be the random number function. So here we have an example of a function. You'll notice that the syntax of this function is such that it starts with a capital R, uh, then the word random, uh, A-N-D-O-M, that has a left and a right parenthesis, and inside of there is the number 100. And we'll talk about what these things are later on in the semester. Um, these things are actually called functions or procedures. Uh, but all we need to know for now is that if we type out exactly what's in bold here in this presentation, what will happen is this intrinsic function will give us back a random number between 0 and 99. How does it do it? I don't know. It's abstracted. It's magic for all I care. I just know that if I do this, I get a pretty uh, random number. It's not perfectly random. It's pseudo random, but it works for most of our cases in, in this class. So we're going to get back a pretty random, num uh, pretty random number, and we don't know how it works. We just know that it works if I execute that specific function. So it's great. We just need to know that this does work. We don't need to worry about how it works, and we get back our random number. There are a number of intrinsic functions in the programming environment that we're using in the first part of this class. They're discussed in the book. We will talk more about it, various intrinsic functions in all of the programming languages and environments we use this semester as we move forward.